I am Kabir Magnani. Hey, I'm Mark Stubbs. I uh, am Principal Architect and Co-Founder of Shoreline IoT. Today we're going to be talking about scaling TinyML to millions of devices. So who we are, so Shoreline is building a system, a complete system, <coughs> excuse me, does end-to-end -end remote asset monitoring. So we take all these tiny devices at the far edge, we do direct sensor to the cloud, and then we take that data and we provide monitoring of these assets and predictive maintenance. So our target applications are industrial assets as well as rotating and vibrating machines. So industrial assets, buildings and plants, oil and gas, utility, et cetera. And specifically, we're working on connecting a lot of sensors and devices inside the plant, like programmable controllers, PLCs, and things with Modbus interfaces, as well as direct to the sensors. Some of the sensors have 0 to 10 or 4 to 20 milliamp output, which we can take, as well as the device that we're going to demonstrate today, which has integrated sensors. Rotating vibrating machines, again, we're looking at motors with vibration, pumps, fans, compressors, etc. So asset management systems today are mostly in-house proprietary from a combination of vendors that are pulled together with an integrator. They're always connected, and they're usually gateway-based. So that leads to having lots of drivers and lots of custom development work that's required to put that together. So if you want to understand how a system works, understand the constraints that shape it. So these are the constraints that are shaping the systems today. So we require real-time information about system health. This requires or results in a requirement for an always-on connection. So next is cellular connections are power hungry. And there's constant data usage can also be costly, especially if you're using a cellular connection. If you have Wi-Fi or some other wireless protocol in the device, it's also always on. That's also consuming a lot of battery power if you have a battery-powered sensor. So this drives a choice to route sensor data or sensor information through a gateway. So the connection required between the sensor and the gateway is often a wired connection. So this results in additional cost because you have to have somebody in, wire, run that cable. It can be very expensive. The end result is the system is costly to deploy, it's hard to scale, and it's used only for high-value assets, leaving a large set of assets unmonitored today. So where that's left us, a study from Cisco shows that 60% of projects never make it out of the proof of concept stage. So that's a little bit of a problem for us. Few companies <clears throat> have an IoT initiative they consider a complete success. And worse than that, 15% of the executive staff believes that it's a complete success. So we need to turn that around. So what's coming? So nearly all the talks have been about some of these solutions. So we're looking at machine learning on these far edge devices, things such as TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. That's going to enable us to expose actionable data and filter out the noise that allows us to get real-time monitoring without an always-on connection. Next, low-power MCUs, such as the Ambic Apollo 3. So this MCU enables us to run on battery-powered, runs the inference engine, looks at the sensors frequently, but doesn't power up the cellular modem until it has to. So that way we can detect and then immediately report faults. And then finally, workflows for machine learning. So those are becoming easier to use, making training and deployment of machine learning in large-scale installations practical for our end customers. <clears throat> so how we're designing our next systems? So we're building a peel and stick sensor that has integrated sensors, it has cellular modem, and it goes directly from the sensor to the cloud. It also has the onboard local machine learning engine. So this allows us to do the machine learning and the inference at the edge that keeps the cellular modem off until we need to send information up to the cloud. The web mobile interface gives us real-time alerts and asset monitoring and configuration, so it allows us to manage all these assets. And the full integrated IoT cloud allows us to manage the devices, user management, and control the AI workflow for these devices. So here's the demonstration. So what we've got is we have the motor on top of the device. 
we have the, the, our sensor. The sensor is attached and we're looking at the bearing housing of the device. So we're using the vibration sensor, so we're using an accelerometer to pick up the information from the, the motor. We have an offset weight. This offset weight simulates an anomaly. So if you can pull up the, the display on the laptop. So this device is connected through AT&T LTE CAD M1 cellular connection directly to our cloud. <clears throat> so you can see currently there's no anomaly. So what we do is we fire up the motor. So we get a bit of good vibration here. So what's going to happen is the accelerometer inside here detects this vibration. It's then going to run the inference engine. Once it detects that anomaly, once it detects it, typical demos. There it goes. So now it's detected it. What it's going to do is it's going to communicate that fault up to the cloud. And then what you'll see is this anomaly here should go red. Are you seeing live data update? We can switch back to. So it's a system that works, which is great. Um, but you know, half half the battle is is finding the pieces that that fit together and and gives us something that solves the problem. But the other half is building this into a system that people want to use and the system that can handle those people. Um, so my role at Shoreline is I'm working on the ML platform that sort of powers a lot of this uh, and. You know, when we're thinking about that, the, the questions that we're left to answer is, you know, what, why aren't the, the solutions that are out there right now, why aren't they getting adopted? Um, and that same Cisco study from earlier found uh, that the five sort of factors that, that are driving, that are preventing adoption the most are sort of all rely on, on a handful of, you know, they boil down to a handful of things. And it's really friction, cost, expertise. Um, and we're, we're trying to build systems that, that solve all of these simultaneously. So, you know, the, the lack of device side integration already takes care of a couple of these for you. Um, you know, there's no, there's no connections between things. You don't really need internal expertise. You can sort of just slap these on and get them up and running. Um, and having this as an external system where you know you have a low fixed monthly whatever uh, puts the budget and quality of data questions on our end. Um, so when we're thinking about sort of who is going to adopt these systems and where are they going to find the most use out of these, we boiled things down into two main user groups. One are sort of field users and machinists. These are people who have been working with the motors and the sensors and the you know, CNCs for years and years and years and have a really strong understanding of the physical operating environment of these devices. Um, but because of that, they have really specific questions that they want answered and really specific data that they want answered, and they want that data collected on a really specific schedule. Um, and often they don't really want to have to think about things like, hey, what is running under the hood that makes this happen? What is this machine learning stuff? Why do I care about it? I just want something that works. The other half of this is domain experts, people who have played with this data for years and years, or developers who are going to be connecting into our devices. Um, these people are sort of fragmented in their specialities. They often don't want to have to think about, oh, you know, I'm a machine learning person. I don't want to have to like work with the C++ code that's running on the device. I just want to run my workflows the way I normally do, and I want my models and my data to be passed along the way that I do, that just works in the way that I want. Um, and so there's a number of design considerations that we're taking into account for these. Um, a lot of that is zero friction. Uh, the, the built-in cellular and the direct cloud connection and the direct authentication, which are things that the user now just doesn't have to think about, doesn't have to worry about, makes it really easy for field users. Um, also being able to walk around with my cell phone and Bluetooth pair to one of these to configure it, set my schedules, don't have to like, think about what, or do this on the cloud side. You know, I don't have to think about what is going on under these devices. I don't have to like deploy, I don't have to like write some JSON configuration and send it down to whatever. Um, as well as building uh, machine learning models that are prepared to deal with 
you know, a, a lack of additional data. There's a lot of work in the machine learning field on how can we, how can we design unsupervised models that, gives a, that give us an understanding of, oh, hey, you know, we expect there to be an issue right now with this probability. And being able to give people interpretable, interpretable error messages and interpretable, hey, we think something is going on with this percent probability, you should take a look. Um, and the other end with domain experts, Again, zero friction. TensorFlow Lite Micro is huge for us here because it lets developers write their models in Python. It prevents any um, sort of, you know, connecting to open standards gives developers a way of sort of being familiar with your product before your product is even out there. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, and that, that way people get what they expect. Um, on top of this, sort of designing workflows that open the door to sort of many levels of sophistication. You can, you can have a large OEM who has a ton of historical data, maybe doesn't have the machine learning expertise to train a model on it, but is happy to you know, bring in the uh, folks to, to have historical data, connect it to your devices, um, give them an oscilloscope view, and they'll tag your data for you, put that into a model, and send it all to the device. Um, or on the other end, you know, just having a model that, as we've done for these devices, collects the data directly from the device, automatically sends it to the cloud, trains a model there, and sends that model back. Um, and now that inference engine can live here, and there was no user interaction as well. So yay, you know, we've got a system that people enjoy, people want to use. Now we have to deal with the failure case that a million people are using at the same time. How do we do that? Um, Sometimes I, I think the folks at Amazon and Google and Azure have made our lives a little too easy, but you know, there's, there's intelligent things that you can still do in terms of, one, obviously put things on auto-scaling clusters where they need to be, but identifying these pressure points. You know, every single time a new model is trained in our architecture, we spin up a separate VM for it. Uh, we provision that VM with the appropriate amount of compute, given how much data we have for that device. We send those VMs only the data relevant to that device, so you don't have any data leakage, you don't have any security concerns with sending, uh, you know, with, with training models on, on one device that gets sent over to another. Um, and we also integrate all of our machine learning platform, machine learning work with, you know, the established industry standards here. So, SageMaker or Google TFX give us access to notebook instances that allow us to see, that allow our clients to, to see their data, to play with their data, to understand what's going on, um, as well as things like job tracking and you know, A-B testing for different types of models if they want to play with that. Um, and the final part of this is you know, device agents that, that function independently of the cloud. These are devices that are gonna stay disconnected from the internet for a, m a large majority of their lives. So coming up with how do we design an architecture that you know, makes sure that, the, that it's configured properly so that the right preprocessor is applied to data before they're sent to models. Um, or how do we you know, isolate the inference engine from the rest of the architecture so we don't have to recompile the code sitting on device every time we wanna update the model. Um, another huge part of this, like Mark mentioned, is you know, having these agents being able to, be, to not only on anomaly events trigger a cellular connection, but being able to, pro, you know, an easy interfaces for uh, users to be able to program rules into, hey, if this happens, send me a notification regardless of if the anomaly events trigger or not. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, a huge amount of work that's been going into how do we make these systems scale, and you know, we'd love to answer questions. And Okay, before and we jump into that, there's one piece of the demo I forgot to do. <laughs> that's showing the, let me see if I can get this up, hang on. So one of the other things, so Gabir had mentioned that we have the Bluetooth connection. So we have, hang on, let me make sure I've got the devices active, there it is. So if I click on the device, unfortunately I don't have this up on the screen. So we've got this ability to click on oscilloscope view, click on get data, and then it communicates with the device. And then right now it's just showing you kind of this flat looking data, right? I don't know if you can see this or not. Perhaps. 
So it's just kind of showing this, this normal data going across. So now if I start this thing back up and make some noise, so if I flip this off, it's on again. Now you can see the graph has changed. So you can see it coming on the screen. You got an anomaly over here? Yep. So now the expert user that Kabir was talking about can go in and explore this data and look and see, is this what he expects? Is this an anomaly? So if he's remote or if he's local on site, he can connect up to it and actually look at the raw data coming out of the system. And for those of you interested, there's really fun machine learning things you can play with here. If you have a user who understands your data and can say, oh, that, that is not actually an anomaly, or this thing that you think isn't an anomaly is, you, know, you can do intelligent you know, changing of thresholds or, or changing of like, architectures to, to design around things like, oh, hey, this is a new piece of information. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.